Hi, everybody. Welcome back to our NYSC and Cube series here. We're here high above courtside, as they say, at the New York Stock Exchange. This is the NYSE Wired Plus Cube CXO series. My name is Dave Vellante. Super excited to be here with Tejas Manoher, who is the co-founder and CEO and co-CEO oh, co of High Touch. Welcome to the Cube at NYSE. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. I always like to ask co-founders, why'd you start the company? Yeah, great question. So I saw this pattern across tons of enterprises um, in all sorts of different industries that companies have a ton of data, right? They have mm. so much data sitting around in data warehouses, data lakes. They're using all this data for analytics, like forecasting revenue, earnings reports. But when you go to a business team like marketing or sales, and you ask them how they're using data for their job, like to figure out what to send customers, they're all struggling. Um, you know, they're asking their peers on the data team for CSVs. They're trying to get uh, technical teams to support them and they're unable to just use data effectively. So I saw this gap, right? We have all the data technology in the world and tons of data from an analytics perspective, but from the perspective of business teams actually using it, there was a problem. And that's what motivated me to start the company. Well, I mean, there's a multi tens of billion, maybe it's a $50 billion industry called BI that's supposed to be solving this problem, but it actually doesn't. Right, because so let's talk about why. Why today's BI and today's data warehouses and data marts and data lakes and and Hadoop clusters and et cetera and big data. Why doesn't that solve the problem? Yeah, great question. So, from a marketing team's perspective, uh, which is one of the biggest teams that we serve, but also any sort of business team uh, at an enterprise, they want to be have easy capabilities to access all of this data that's in data warehouses like Snowflake or Databricks or Google Cloud or AWS. And then they want to be able to easily operationalize this data. So take it and use it to power a marketing campaign that they're sending customers or use all this data to decide who to give what discounts and ultimately use this data to grow their business. What BI provides, um, so software like Tableau or Looker, we don't really consider it a competitor to high touch. What those tools provide are the ability to make charts or reports or answer questions on your data. But what we are really providing companies is a way to connect that data about your customers to Salesforce, to Facebook ads, to Adobe, to all the tools that are actually sending communications to those customers and to give you intelligence on top as a marketing team that allows you to decide what's the right treatment per customer to really grow your revenues. As so you're the top part of that iceberg, is that right? Exactly, but you still the have last to, mile. But you, you, the last mile, which is always the hardest, but you still have to absorb, don't you, all that, that hidden information underneath. Is that, is that, first of all, is that correct? Yeah, it is 100% correct. So we sit on top of you know, structured and unstructured data in companies' data warehouses, data lakes, and we also give companies like PetSmart, like Warner Music, like some of the large enterprises we serve, tools to help them merge that customer together, figure out what is a customer across my point of sales and e-commerce and website and loyalty program systems, and really figure that out. And then we do the last mile of putting that in the hands of business teams to actually use to tailor what you're going to send customers, what you're going to say to them in stores, whether you're going to give them discounts or not, and all those decisions you have to make about customers. Okay, so when, when we talk about last mile, a lot of times you think about last mile, you think of things like you know, cable TV uh, <laughs> or the, you know, the landlines. It was always the hardest thing. You have to just lay physical connectivity. But there's more to your story because not only is, is the last mile that last piece of the puzzle, but you have to somehow, I think, harmonize all that data. You got data, like you said, in data lakes and data warehouses, et cetera. Like, how do you know that a customer means a customer or not a prospect or a division of a company? That, or that revenue actually equals revenue and not ARR, NRR, price equals price, not the discounted price. Am I correct that part of your job is to harmonize all that data? It's a great question. So I'll answer this in two parts. Um, a lot of the other solutions that exist to help marketing teams and business teams use all their data at an enterprise, first say that step one, you need to get all your data into their system in their format. So Salesforce is an example of this, Adobe. Snowflake. Um, Snowflake is actually a little bit more of a flexible, open-ended platform. Oh, um, interesting that you say that. We'll come back to that. Yeah, we'll come back to it. So 
uh, most of the business software out there that's, that says, hey, we'll, we'll identify a customer, we'll help you personalize your marketing to them, they require you to first get the data in their format. That is a huge effort for an enterprise that never really ends up happening, right? Uh, right? Because there's so much data, every company is different, and the work required to get it all into a system, uh, like a SaaS system, is just you know, crazy high. Um, so what HighTouch does is we tap into the work that data and analytics teams are already doing at companies on top of technologies like Snowflake, Databricks, and broadly the cloud, right? They're, every enterprise is investing in figuring out their data in the cloud. We allow marketing teams to tap directly into that data uh, without re requiring you to translate all that data into a high-touch format. And that's kind of some of the core IP of our technology and why really large enterprises like you know, uh, Warner Music, PetSmart, NBA, Spotify, all adopt high touch versus something like Salesforce or Adobe to manage their data. The second thing is, yes, we do have some tools that help with the harmonization of data, particularly one of the big challenges you mentioned of identity resolution or determining what is a customer across all these different systems. So, okay, let's get into the, uh, the, the how you do that. What, yeah. can, you, can you talk about your sort of secret sauce to some extent, your unique IP, what makes you guys different? Yeah, so from some of the how uh, from our platform. So first and foremost, we have the ability to sit directly on top of data warehouses like Snowflake, Databricks, et cetera, without copying the data at all. So a big challenge in enterprises is that they don't want to copy all their data to right. some SaaS system. Um, whenever that's the paradigm, which is the case for most SaaS software today, you know, every SaaS system has its own database. You need to copy the data into it. Um, enterprises always limit the amount of data they put in those systems. But because we actually sit directly on the warehouse, like we don't have a database of customer information at high touch. We use your data warehouse as that database. Um, enterprises are willing to give us a lot more access to information, which means marketing teams are actually able to use a ton more information to uh, personalize how they engage with their customers and drive them to the outcomes they want. Um, the other aspect of it is that we don't store any data. Right? We don't store any data at all. It all lives in the customer's cloud and the customer's premises. Um, on top of that, uh, a big selling point of the software is that it's really easy to use for marketing teams. Uh, we actually have a UI that allows marketing teams to do everything they need from a data perspective. So querying the data, building audiences of customer information, um, you know, syncing those to various different systems that they use, like marketing tools or ad networks or even using that data on your website to personalize the customer experience, running experiments, so figuring out if A is better than B, uh, and lastly, starting to use ML and AI to actually determine what's the best treatment on a per customer basis using all that data. What's your, talk about your, um, I'm interested in your go-to-market strategy. Uh, are you partners, for instance, with Snowflake and, and Databricks, you run on top of those platforms, other, other partners, describe your go-to-market. Yeah, great question. So. Um, a few a few things. Uh, we are first and foremost partners with kind of all the major clouds and cloud data warehouses. So Snowflake, Databricks, Google, AWS, and you name it. And from a go to market perspective, Microsoft too. Um, yeah, yeah, we yeah, work okay. with we work with Azure as well. Because you never know, you, Microsoft can be competitive, and but you no, got to be no, in the Microsoft sure. ecosystem. It's an ecosystem, yeah, right? right? And you you got to be in it. Yeah. It's what the enterprise. Okay, use. so of all the cloud players, we partner with the them. data platforms. Mm -hmm. Okay, and and even some of the business tools. So at different ad networks like Facebook or TikTok oh, okay. or uh, different software providers like a HubSpot is actually an investor, a strategic investor in high touch. Oh, okay. So we partner with those folks and when you know, their sales teams or their customer success teams see a challenge in their customer base, because you know, they're talking to the big companies like the PetSmarts, NBA, the Warner Musics of the world, they'll actually loop high touch in and say, hey, this company has a lot of data in Snowflake, but they're having some difficulty using it from a marketing perspective and figuring out how to take that and personalize all the marketing and advertising and website experiences they're delivering to their customers to grow their LTV and grow their revenues. Um, so that's one part of our go-to-market strategy. Another part of it is uh, that uh, there is a big category of software called CDP or Customer Data Platform. Yep. Before founding HighTouch, I was actually an early engineer and product leader at a company called Segment, which helped found that space. I uh, got acquired by Twilio for three and a half billion a few years ago. Congratulations. And thanks. And um, Was that your first exit? Uh, yeah, it was. Oh, nice. yeah, I wasn't the founder, but it was an early awesome. employee of it. Yeah. yeah, you learned a lot, I bet. Definitely <laughs> learned a lot. I joined when it was about 20 people. Um, Amazing. So, and 
uh, what, what I found is that that category of software has a lot of demand. Every underpriced marketing team is saying, I want a CDP because I want the ability to get all my data in one place and use it for marketing. But that category of software doesn't work super well in the enterprise due to the complexity around getting all your data into a SaaS system. So the big innovation we have at Hightouch is saying, hey, over the last five years, everyone's been investing in these cloud data warehouses. How do we get that data in the hands of marketing teams? So we do a lot of marketing and we get a lot of inbound around this concept of a composable CDP uh, or a CDP that sits on the warehouse. And when did you start the company? You started the company about five years ago. Okay, and you raised 92 million. Is that yeah. right? Is that an accurate yeah. number? And at this point, you've got product market fit, would you say? For sure, yeah. We work with uh, you know over 700 companies at this point, um, hundreds of enterprises, uh, and dozens of the Fortune 500. They're renewing, presumably, yeah, right? 100%, so yeah, 100%. Yeah, our GRRs are high yeah. 90%, actually. So Awesome. And so how did you know when you had product market fit? And then how did you decide when to scale go to market? Because the reason I ask that is I see a lot of companies, the biggest mistake they make is they try to scale go to market before they even have product market fit. So how did you how did you know and how did you manage that that transition from where you and your co-founder were probably the key salespeople, you were consultants, yeah. you were building the process belly to belly to then transitioning to scale go to market? Great question. So man, and, and five years ago feels like a long time when you're working <laughs> at a startup. I'll but <laughs> uh, I think one of the key indicators for us that we had product market fit. Actually, there were two things that really come to mind. First and foremost was some of the early customer traction. Um, I felt like actually at the time that we had just three customers, um, we had the sense that there was something here because we noticed that these customers were in completely different industries, mm. but had the same problem. So one customer was a SaaS company out in Silicon Valley that's pretty notable. You know, another one was a healthcare uh, D2C brand, you know, they made different healthcare medical products for consumers, the conglomerate of them actually. And another one was a newspaper. And then we looked at the pipeline of customers we're talking about, and they were also in tons of different industries. And the fact that they all had the same problem, which is that it's difficult for me to use all my data for marketing. I have to keep going to engineering, to keep asking data to, you know, merge data together. And it takes weeks and weeks to just try an experiment of an idea I have. Um, that told us, hey, there's something here. These companies are completely different. One of them was in Norway, out of all places, and had the same problem that we saw in Silicon Valley. The second thing that we found was we did a lot of customer discovery uh, because you know there's a lot of companies out there trying to solve this. Segment, Salesforce CDP, Adobe CDP. I've seen many companies rise and fall around the idea of helping businesses use their customer data. And that, that was really important to us that we're not just going to build the same thing in the end of the day and face the same consequences. But what really inspired us was that we talked to some of the largest enterprises in the world. So companies like Netflix and Walmart. And what we found was that everyone was saying the same thing. Eventually, they can't get all their data into something like Salesforce, Adobe, or a CDP. They need to invest in their own data platform, like a Snowflake, like a Databricks and build a CDP on top of that. And we thought, OK, if the biggest companies in the world are doing this um, and all the small companies are facing a challenge, why don't we be the solution to bring that tech from the Facebooks, from the Netflix of the world, down to the rest of the market? Well, it's interesting. You, you mentioned Walmart. We've featured Walmart on theCUBE several times now in, in our Palo Alto studio. And what they've done with their triplet model and the, to create a, a common experience, we call it a super cloud across their clouds. But also, they've done something similar with AI. Um, and, and so they can't just throw it all into one platform. It's just not practical. And now you're seeing, I'm sure you, you see this with your customers, open data formats. Yes. Bringing the engine to yes. any any compute, to any data. So that's- Iceberg that's and Delta Lake. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so that's sort of to, to your point about Snowflake before. They are, yeah, yeah. They've, they've, the market's forcing them to open up. We can generalize that statement to any sort of data lake or data platform. But the the truth is that companies need to invest in something. Right. right, and standardize around that. Yeah, We're a big believer in open data platforms. Five years ago, when you and your co-founder started the company, what a, what type of AI were you doing and what how has that evolved today? It's a great question, it's a great question. So we're actually very excited about AI, first and foremost. I mean, who isn't? <laughs> but I would say that we're excited about it in a way that I think is different than a lot of the players oh, in the so. marketing space. Um, so in, in marketing and AI, or just in AI in general right now, the hot topic is around generative AI, right? Generating 
content, helping marketing teams write emails, generating more creative than they could have before, um, and more or less tr just trying to like emulate the an army of people doing yeah. something mm -hmm. through an AI. What we're really excited about is using AI to do stuff that it just wasn't possible to do with humans before. And I believe that the opportunity there is decisioning. So we launched a product recently called AI Decisioning. And the high level of that product is that we sit on top of all the customer data and we look at an individual customer basis to determine what is the best treatment for that customer. So should we give them a discount? To what extent? What kind of email should we send them? What should we show them on the website? Um, what's the right goal to these customers? Should I get them? Should I be encouraging them to download an app, or should I be encouraging them to go into the store? And we do that all optimizing towards lifetime value of a customer. Um, and uh, we don't actually generate content and stuff like that in this usage of AI. We're all focusing on the decisioning problem or the quantitative side. And I believe that's actually an underlooked opportunity with a lot of the AI discussion today is the traditional machine learning, reinforcement learning, propensities, predictive ML. I think can be used a step a step further than a lot of the market is using today. So it's kind of the next next best action, if you will, and cause and effect. Causal AI is obviously something that is yeah, that is a part of, of the technology as well. You, you, really, you guys are, are doing stuff in causal. So we we're doing research and to figure out the best tactics to mm -hmm. use and like causal inference, you know, stuff like that is is a part of the equation. I'd like to connect you to our our causal AI analyst uh, Scott Hebner, who's based in he's would just be great. a little upstate. Yeah, and so we'll a lot that. of it also is experimentation, right? Mm -hmm. I think oh, the way a lot of companies are uh, approaching AI right now is give us all your historical data, and we'll tell you what discount you should offer, what marketing you should send, what's the next best action. That doesn't actually work a lot of the times. Mm -hmm. uh, what you need is an autonomous system that is actually just doing experiments, right? Is actually running experiments of what if I send this customer this and that customer that, and running these you know mini A/B tests effectively, mm -hmm. continuously, in, essentially in real time. Exactly. And, and 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 now you've got you've not only got the historical uh, analytic data, but you've got the sort of real time data of the of digital representation of the business. Some people call it a digital twin, and then you can do those real time A/B tests and then really figure out the next best action before all the data changes. Right? Exactly, and that experimentation part is, is critical to mm -hmm. how the product works from a technical perspective right. because the historical data often actually doesn't have what you need to really interpret what you should do in the future. What's next for you guys? Are you, are you, are you well-funded? Are you doing a raise? Are you doing an IPO? What's, what do we look forward Great to? Great question. So we, we have an aspiration of you know, going public. We want to take this company big. We believe there's an opportunity to create you know, a next player in the market of the level of the Salesforce or Adobe on top of this data and AI revolution that's going on right now. Um, but as it stands right now, we're growing the business, uh, you know, proud to say that it's growing at 100% plus year on year. Um, and we are focused on, you know, taking on more and more enterprise customers and really building towards this vision of customer experiences being decided using ML and AI on a per customer basis. Yeah, well, you're five years in, you know, as you know, it takes five to seven years at least to build a company and then another few years to really get to scale. I think it and, takes at least 10 years you know, to build I would a company so. in the state we need. I think these days, it's funny, in this day of AI where everything's supposedly so compressed and happening faster, you, you know, you're really, it's hard to get to a public market inside of 10 years at least in a way that is really attractive for well, investors. We'll see, a lot of things are happening past in AI, but things need to happen durably as well, right? Yeah. And things are happening so fast, but we have to see how that market pans out over time, right? Um, you know, if technology starts to plateau or anything like that, there can be massive changes in the players in the market. So we're really focused on building, you know, a long-term business here. Well, it's fantastic having you on theCUBE. Best of luck and Thank hope you. to have you back. I appreciate it. All right, you're very welcome. All right, keep it right there. This is Dave Vellante for theCUBE plus NYSE Wired here, high above the New York Stock Exchange trading floor. We're right back right after this short break.